Welcome to Digital Oil and Gas with Jeffrey Can. I'm Jeffrey. Digital Oil and Gas looks at the impact of digital technology on the global oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Can on Twitter or at jeffreycan.com. Welcome back to another episode of uh, Digital Oil and Gas. My name is Jeffrey and welcome to the podcast today. And I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Karczewski. (laughs) Did I get that right, Chris? You sure did. (laughs) It's a bit of a challenge uh, for me. Um, There's this lack of familiarity with uh, uh, some of the names from around the world. Uh, But today we're going to talk about the challenges of implementing digital technologies in oil and gas operations. And Chris had the enviable role of leading the uh, rollout of these digital tools in operations at an oil company for uh, uh, probably two or three years, I I think. And and, uh, I invited him onto the podcast to share some of his experiences with that. So Chris, uh, this is uh, where we're going to go today. Are you ready? (laughs) I'm ready, Jeffrey. (laughs) Well, let's begin first with a a little bit about your background, where uh, where you hail from and uh, what uh, got you into the oil industry in the first instance. Sure, sure. So um, I'm a professional engineer. Um, I graduated from the University of Calgary with a bachelor degree um, in mechanical engineering. Now, that was many moons ago. Um, (laughs) And I have been in the industry for just over 25 years. Okay. Um, So come to think of it, I was actually involved in the oil and gas industry for even longer than that, way before I graduated from UFC. So I have a bit of a funny story that I can share with you if you'd like to hear (laughs) I'm sure, I'm sure as long as it's uh, g- g- suitable for family audiences, this is an iTunes requirement. So. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds good. Well, it is a family story. Um, so um, my family and I, we immigrated to Canada from Poland uh, when I was 14 years old. That's the funny spelling of my first uh, name, right. difficult spelling of my last name, uh, as I'm sure you've noticed. Uh, so Chris is just short for Christoph or Krzysztof, if you say it in Polish. Krzysztof, yeah. Um, uh, so back then, when we first arrived in Canada, my parents uh, would hold two jobs each just to make ends meet. Um, my mom would clean the offices downtown Calgary in the evenings as one of her jobs, and I would tag along with her at times to help her clean, just so we can then get to another cleaning job later in the evening with my dad and my sister. Mm. Okay, mm. It, it was like a like a whole family affair, you know, all hands on deck, so to speak, mm-hmm. right? Um, so you know, cleaning these offices downtown, which typically belong to oil and gas companies. Um, I saw these colorful geological maps of <laughs> reservoirs hanging on the walls, you know. Oh, totally. And, uh, yeah, and picture yeah. of these pump jacks and pumps and big gas plants, uh, you know, and there were these fossilized rocks in the boardroom on display, you know. Mm. Uh, of course, I didn't speak a word of English, so it was all very foreign to me, but it was just so all very so amazing to this immigrant kid, you know, and I was mesmerized by this stuff, you know. I couldn't read the maps. And I didn't understand how a pump worked, but I knew it was cool. Okay, <laughs> and uh, it was really those early days that cemented the fact that I wanted to work in the oil industry one day. So there, there's the key to uh, boosting the enrollment rates in oil and gas: is <laughs> take take 14 year old impressionable kids through uh, office towers uh, to see the uh, cool tech. Because it is it, oil and gas. I mean, we we don't give ourselves enough credit. We have the coolest tech in the world. Uh, to do what we need to do. And you had a chance to see it, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what? And it just, it inspired me early in life to do it Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, to to get in touch with it. And then as I went through mechanical engineering and university, you know, I just had the ability to build on it. You know, the the funny thing is about a decade later, after I got transferred from my first pad job in Red Deer from a company called IPS, and when they transferred me to Calgary, I ended up working in uh, the same office tower that my mom and I used to clean back in the days. Can you can you believe that? You know, I, I just thought it was really really cool. That's a great story. So th- this uh, fast forward now. So you have your engineering degree. You get into the oil industry, and uh, you you kind of I assume you you take a you know as many people do in this industry, they take roles with different companies and progress their way up. But uh, so let's let's turn to the just in the interest of time, let's turn to the uh, the, the role you were playing most recently. Uh, which involved the adoption of digital technologies in operations in an oil company. Um, For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, my my most recent role was uh, with a company called NAL Resources, uh, where I was a manager of production from about mid-2015 
until its sale to Whitecap in January of this year. Of this year, yeah, it was purchased by uh, Whitecap. In case you're not you're watching the news, <laughs> Whitecap did right. was the acquirer. Yeah. And so, you know, I looked after field production operations, production engineering, uh, as well as automation. Okay. And at its peak, we were producing um, just over 41,000 BOEs per day from approximately 2,400 wells or so across Alberta and Saskatchewan. So, you know, our well production was anywhere from few barrels per day to few hundred barrels per day. Um, good mix of oil and gas wells in that, uh, but definitely a lot of wells to look after. Now, were they concentrated in a specific play or were they spread out uh, geographically across a variety of different formations? Yeah, it's, it was definitely the latter. Um, you know, we had uh, we had wells up in, um, you know, Sturgeon Lake, uh, sort of northern Alberta, mm. going uh, down as far east as eastern Saskatchewan, close to Manitoba border. So we we're very geographically spread and, um, you know, a bunch of different plays, um, you know, shallow gas wells, deep sour oil wells, you name it, we had it. So it was very, very um, you know, diverse. Well, I, I've been a big fan of, of NAL resources um, ever since I... Uh, connected up with um, the the management team there, probably in 2000 and I'm going to say 2016, 2017. Uh, Corey Berg, who was the VP of Finance, uh, Keith Steves, who was the CFO, have both appeared on this podcast talking about the work of digital adoption in the industry. Although in their case, their focus was more aimed at the uh, the, the the structure of these businesses, uh, the finance area, supply chain, and the like. You're you're different in the sense that you're actually out in the field and, and uh, driving change. Um, can you can you characterize some of the problems that you saw that you were trying to fix with digital tools? Yeah, for sure. Um, so you know, there is um, obviously we had a very robust. Uh, corporate and initiative to um, you know improve efficiencies of the company. Yeah. Um, and the main reason for that, obviously, is to drive down the costs. Um, you know, oil and gas companies we face many pressures. Um, you know, be it the you know um, fluctuating oil and gas prices that create the boom and bust cycles. Um, you know, whether it's um, you know protecting the environment and making sure that you know we don't have any spills. Um, you know that we uh, have good social responsibilities in the areas that we uh, operate in. Mm -hmm. Carbon taxes, regulatory fees, you know, all that really adds a lot of pressures on the bottom line. Um, so um, as most oil and gas companies, NAL was ultimately after reducing the dollars per barrel produced, um, you know, while maintaining safe, compliant and responsible operations on the 2400 wells mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that we were operating. And what did what does this actually look like in practice um, in in the field? Do, uh, for instance, um, <clears throat> there, there, there's a lot of digital innovation you can put on a specific oil well, but if if you've got a producing well, I wonder whether the I don't think the economics actually justify taking a well offline and then festooning it with uh, digital sensors. And I might be wrong, but is that the kind of thing that you were you were pro uh, tackling? Yeah, I wouldn't say that we took wells offline for a particularly long period of yeah. time in order to accomplish that. Mm. Uh, but, um, you know, we sort of went down this automation path in, in, in kind of parallel, three parallel steps. You know, um, you know, first we sort of took stock of what we already had out um, on our operations, right? Um, and then, you know, we knew that we had some ability to, you know, generate digital data and some ability to control wells remotely and um, mm. things like that. Uh, but, um, you know, it was really sort of bits and pieces. You know, it wasn't a full picture that we could see. And so, you know, we, one of the first things that we did, we said, well, let's try to maximize what we, are, uh, what we already have. And let's see if we can leverage off of that data. You know, are we really using it to its most potential mm. or, um, you know, is it just out there to, you know, to, to sort of, you know, help people as they do their daily jobs. And it was, and it definitely was one, the, the latter side where, um, you know, people were great about using the technology sort of in their own individual, uh, you know, sort of spheres to help them run their daily activities. But there wasn't a concerted, uh, sort of central effort that would take that data in and it would, um, you know, transform the operations from, you know, your sort of um, traditional boots on the ground, you know, going to well every day, checking it to one that was more data driven. Mm. So, um, you know, that was the first path was to essentially take what we had because, you know, the company's been around for a long time. 
They've had a bunch of acquisitions over the years. They've had SCADAs, they've had pop-off controllers, smart timers and stuff like that. So we said, well, let's take a look and make sure we're really maximizing the use of everything that's out there. And so that was our first step. Did anything surprise you in going and doing that inventory? <clears throat> Things you didn't didn't know you had, or dis discovered that uh, you know you you were uh, you're, you're in a better position than you thought you were. What, what did you learn from that exercise? Well, yeah, you know, I, I think I think there was a little bit of a of a surprise, maybe uh, how much stuff we actually had. Mm. Uh, there was a lot of automation out there already. Um, you know, the other surprising piece was that you know we had uh, we had different servers. We had like. Uh, an Xbox server in Saskatchewan and two in Alberta. Uh, and, uh, you know, they were, yeah, it was, it was like, why do we have so many, right? Should we be consolidating that and, yeah. uh, you know, essentially administer it from a central spot yeah. know, where one person, you know, set it up the same way. So all the devices talking to it speak the same language, so to speak. Uh, you know, let's say all the pressures are coming in, in KPA versus KPA and PSI and things like that, right? Mm. So, so that was a, it, it was a bit of a surprise, um, you know, as to what we had, by, by, by uh, you know, uh, what we found out as to what we had. Why, why is it that oil companies find themselves in this position where they have this huge spread of uh, technologies across the landscape um, and, um, and, and, uh, and it, and it, it's it's so fragmented. What is is it because of this this acquisition, um, grow by acquisition model, and then you you just don't you don't bother to sort of straighten everything up to a common architecture, or like well, what's what's behind that? Any idea? Well, you know, I, I think it is a little bit of that as well. Um, mm. It's you know, as you acquire stuff, like it takes an effort uh, to you know, standardize it, it does, but then yeah. it also takes a uh, focus and it takes a uh, strategy to standardize it. And, um, you know, I found that uh, the companies that I've worked for, at least, um, it was, um, you know, a lot of taking it in, but, but not standardizing that, um, you know, the equipment that you did have, because it, it's quite an effort to actually do that. Now, there's definitely benefits and a payout uh, at the end of the day when you do that, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, typically companies are focused on, you know, getting that next barrel out of the ground, you know, drilling for, for you know, for new res reserve additions and things like that. So optimization is always mm -hmm. um, uh, upfront and it's, it's a focus, but maybe the digital optimization hasn't been as much of a, you know, of a focus lately. Yeah. And this is, I found this phenomenon actually in many other industries that do grow by acquisition. And um, uh, as an example, I worked for a ski hill operator at one point uh, many years ago who had acquired 13 ski hills. And each ski hill was, of course, because they were acquired from family owned businesses and they were rolled into the corporation. Each ski hill ran independently, like completely disassociated from the others. And the consequence was uh, the if, if the head office wanted to offer a lift pass that was useful across two ski hills, impossible to do because the systems were all completely different. They even called like what was defined as a child's pass on one hill was completely different from the pass for a child on another hill. And so right. they, they ended up, they had this what I call a technical debt that they ultimately accrued and then would need to pay. And um, it sounds like oil and gas uh, frequently lets that technical debt build up um, because it's still economic to run the business without doing the rationalization. And then eventually it'll catch up to you, I suppose. Yeah, that's exactly it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's a very economic business, and that potentially that's why um, you know maybe some of these things weren't addressed earlier. Yeah. Uh, you know, as we found uh, at NAL, um, there is a lot of great economics behind doing digital transformation and actually focusing on that part of the business. It pays for itself. You know, it improves the bottom line and it makes your operations a lot more efficient. Not to mention the fact that it gives you an insight into what costs are irreducible versus controllable, mm. controllable versus not controllable, uh, which is which is great. You know, you definitely need to know that in order to whether it's to grow, whether it's to optimize or whether it's even to decide um, about um, disposing some of the stuff that you have that may not be core to your strategy. So Corey, when, when he was on the podcast, talked about how the company applied bot technologies and um, uh, uh, blockchain technologies to streamline royalty payments. Can you share an example of the kinds of technologies you would have been rolling out in operations that, that yielded um, a truly measurable benefit? For sure. Um, you know, one that comes to mind is mm. um, in our Western Saskatchewan operations where um, we took um, single well batteries and we equipped them with uh, digital tank levels. 
um, versus the manual ones that manual ones that we had in place. Um, and so, typically in the past, an operator would have to drive to location um, every day or every second day and uh, take the the tank readings, come back to the office, type it in. Um, you know, you get the picture. Not very, not very, not efficient. very efficient. <laughs> very, very carbon intense, uh, dangerous. When you think about windshield act, uh, windshield time is always a huge cause of uh, accidents in this industry. Is uh, you know, deer jumping in front of your truck. Um, but but uh, you know, just and the, just driving around, it's, it's just time consuming. But yeah, not very absolutely. efficient. Absolutely, it's it's mm -hmm. a huge, huge. Uh, you know, eats up your time enormously. Um, so after we deployed these digital tank levels. Uh, that information was sent automatically to our central location, mm. right? In, in this case, Prodview, essentially, right? Yep. Uh, it would populate Prodview. I mean, an operator would still have to take a quick look at the data to qualify and make sure it looked good. Uh, that's something they didn't get stuck, although that's another story, and we can talk about how to automate <laughs> that later. But but in, in essence, um, they would take this, um, this, this data would travel automatically to Prodview, and uh, our operators were able to operate a lot more wells uh, that were just newly drilled without adding any single in any additional operators, right? So that was a great outcome and saved us money. You know, I think we drilled over 120 wells and we didn't add one single operator to the area. Oh so, wow. Because you're able to effectively for that just just through that be able to identify uh, the the um, the tank fill to a point where it needed to be relieved and and then you could appropriately schedule it without having to do all the driving around. That's, that's exactly it, right? That's exactly it. You know, hmm. essentially you took that that manual um, activity and you automated it. Thus, you freed up a bunch of time for operators. You know, I mean, guys, it, there was a it was a big area. That guys could spend two or three hours a day just getting from location to location, yeah. right, uh, to collect the data. Now, not to say that we didn't want the guys out in the field, uh, the operators out in the field anymore. Uh, there was still a lot of work for them to do there. But that driving time, sort of that routine, non-purposeful driving time, was converted to a uh, you know more productive time where they could go and uh, you know do some maintenance items or go to a well that actually failed and needed their attention. So that was the whole point behind doing what we wanted, what we were doing. It was converting our operations to this, what, what we call uh, operating by exception um, style operations. Do you have it? <clears throat> That's a great example, by the way, and, and one I've actually written about um, uh, on my uh, blog series because it's uh, it's it seems to me like an obvious and low what I call low hanging fruit. You know, it's pretty obvious if you if you uh, put a a uh, digital tank reader in place. Um, are there other examples? Anything else that that was in that same sort of realm as to super easy uh, uh, delivered a uh, me truly measurable benefit that that people were very very pleased to see. Uh, um, rolled in yeah I, I think the other one that that uh, we were very proud of was um, you know, maybe not as common in oil field operations mm -hmm. but but it was the deployment of video cameras you know oh. and uh, th that essentially allowed our operators to conduct this you know in quotations virtual site visit right um, you know we would typically combine cameras with other sensors you know whether it's pressure transducers maybe POCs uh, maybe uh, V of these variable frequency drives. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just as far as the cameras go, I mean, these these devices are cheap these days, you know. You can buy a pan-tilt pan zoom camera for less than 500 bucks, right? Um, <clears throat> That's the price, of, now, the price of one drive out to some of these remote sites will cost you that kind of money. So yeah, That's exactly it. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. We actually, when we first uh, deployed it, we tried it on a very remote site where there was a single maybe two wells uh two single well batteries that an operator had to drive to i think two yeah. hours mm. right so i mean the payout was was immediate it was just like this yeah. um you know and now there's obviously costs associated with installing the cameras making sure it communicates um you know but but still it, it just you know cell communication is is good for most part uh data communication is cheap you know so it really became viable technology allowed us to do that I'm 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 pretty confident too that the benefit to the operator is that because they see they, the camera is telling them what's on the site they're not driving into the unknown here, <laughs> you know they're driving they're driving Absolutely. yeah they're driving to a site knowing what they're going to find it's not uh, it's not uh, so that has to be a stress reducer I would think for, uh, for I, the I, would, I think so as well you know I mean what we typically had after we set up uh, all these cameras we're in places where we thought they were. Uh, they were useful, so we didn't mm -hmm. go and we just blanket our operation with it. Uh, but you know, we did an assessment, and in places that they were useful, 
the operators would then quickly scan in the morning. They would scan through the pictures yeah, of course. just to see if there was any wellhead leaks, was the polish rod rotating, uh, you know, was everything working as planned. And if everything was, and if the sensors, if nothing was telling them that they didn't need to be there, they wouldn't go there. Right. right? Uh, to your point, though, if they did see a leak, let's say, on a stuffing box, they, they could better prepare themselves in terms of the tools that they had or, you know, do they have the, uh, the, the skill to fix it or should they be calling somebody else? That's the thought process that they went through. Yeah. Uh, and it really, um, you know, really revolutionized in the way we were operating our wells. And so um, uh, as you're kind of rolling this out, what's the, I mean, you have 2,400 wells. You're not dropping in uh, cameras everywhere uh, instantly. You're, you're, you know, as typical oil and gas, you put them into a, as you say, remote place, try it out, see how it goes. What, what was the company's reaction uh, when you um, began to show what the, uh, what the art of the possible was? Did you encounter a lot of resistance or a lot of, yeah, I don't believe you, this is fake news, or did you see the opposite, which is, wow, this is really exciting, and I'd like to see this in my uh, my part of the field. What, what, what happened? Yeah, you know, it was probably a bit of both in the beginning. Mm. You know, there were some people that were very excited about the technology right off the bat, Yeah, um, and uh, they wanted to see it. They wanted to use it. Um, you know, on the other hand, there were folks who um, had some questions about it, and, uh, you know, naturally, a lot of the changes that we were making uh, were to the field operations. Of course, yeah. And, uh, you know, these guys, they, um, you know, they were operating and they were doing these jobs for, uh, you know, years and years. And they were doing them the same way. Um, so, you know, it's like anything as human beings, when we get used to doing it a certain way and someone comes around and tells you to do it differently, you know, the natural question is, well, why do you want me to change? Yeah. What, yeah. You know, what am I doing wrong the- here? Like, what's... <laughs> <laughs> what like it's been working all along why are you telling me to change it all of a sudden What's exactly the last yeah. year you told me i was the best operator and this year you're telling me i need to change right yeah yeah please uh, explain but, you know so 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 there was questions but um you know i would say by and large there wasn't a staunch opposition or unwillingness to change or to adopt mm-hmm. um you know i would say it felt like people were looking for a solid business case justification right, right. um and, and i would say in fact we wanted our people to be critical thinkers you know, challenge us, you know, suggest improvements, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that's how operational excellence is done, right? Yeah, of course, uh, yeah. You know, the continuous improvement, thinking about how you're doing your job, you know, is the change that you're proposing, is it the right one? Is it yeah. going to, to make sense? Um, you know, so so it, it, it was a bit of a mix, but like I say, it, I didn't feel like there was a, you know, big overwhelming opposition to this. It was more about, hey, show me why why what you're trying what you're proposing makes sense here yeah i think if you i mean in, in reality is in operations as you point out we condition people for a very long period of time with a very uh, a clear set of messages stability reliability operational excellence no downtime and this creates a, a world where you try to resist unnecessary change because you it, it impacts these these different uh, factors that you believe are the most important because you've been conditioned to, for to those messages now right, we right, introduce exactly. a yeah now we introduce a whole new message which says no 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 <laughs> Time to change. <laughs> like, well, hang yeah. on a second. I have, we've had 20 years of this message. Where where did this come from? And where do, are you sure yeah. you've thought about this? And have you thought yeah. about the safety issues? And what about this? And what about this? Yeah. So. And, you know, our operators, they had this very high degree of ownership in what they did. Oh, right? totally, totally. Uh, yeah. You know, they, they looked after these wells like they were their own. You know, their biggest concern was to, you know, you're telling me not to go there. Well, what if there's a spill? Yeah. Right. It's yeah. going to be on me. You're going to you're going to look at me and say, well, why didn't you go there? Right. So we had to work on that message and to make sure that they knew that this is a uh, corporate initiative and we are behind them. And, you know, we're not going to hang them high and dry when something happens. Exactly. You know, at the same time, we want their input to see if, uh, you know, if, if they if they think that we are addressing the risks adequately. Right. So, you know. Anyways, that that was sort of the, the the approach. I think it's a it's a great message that you have to. Um, I, as I say, I say to people, you, the 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 frontline worker needs to know that management's got their back, and and and, and that means you know, and you know, I got to get out of jail card. <laughs> really, yeah. you know, if there's if, if there's as you point out, there, if there's a leak at the well site, but you've told me not to go to rely on the cameras, you have to carry that fault, not me as the operator, because I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to support you in your initiative to roll out cameras. Uh, so somehow that message has to be very clearly communicated, or the the frontline workers are going to be totally confused about what you're trying to do. 
Right. Absolutely. And, you know, I remember we had we had many of these meetings with our operators uh, yeah. out in the field, right, where where they could actually speak their mind and uh, tell us what their concerns were. Um, and then when we actually did the risk assessment of each individual well, we would bring the operator team for that particular run and have them participate in it, uh, you know, to take stock of what devices we have, what is it telling us, what data analytics we're going to have in the background to tell yeah. them that everything is fine uh, and, uh, you know, is anything missing. And, uh, you know, I think that generated a really good solution at the end and uh, a lot of folks who were, who were very bought into this. And I think, too, the message that um, <clears throat> you're actually going to grow the business, that has to weigh prominently here, right? Because um, NAL was drilling wells but not adding staff. So uh, the, the message, to the, I think, to the staff would, would be, if we do this, we can grow the company. Is, was, right. that, was that part of the communications that was critical to the success here? It was, um, you know, and, you know, at NAL at one point had, uh, you know, plans to, to get even bigger, yeah. um, you know, and so there were, there were, we were obviously drilling and, and getting organically bigger, but, uh, you know, there was, there was quite a few acquisitions along the way as well. Of course. Yeah. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with those acquisitions, we, you know, managed to, um, you know, operate and take on a lot more wells and operate them with the existing operators. Right. So I think it was, it was good for job security for those guys when they actually saw, um, what the technology can do and that, you know, they can operate another 100 or 200 wells, yeah, of course, um, yeah. right, with, with the tools that they had. So, yeah. Yeah, big upside there. <clears throat> now that you've been, I mean, you've been at the front line of driving this out, what, what do you see as the untapped potential for uh, the use of these digital tools in operations? I mean, I, I know you, you, because of the transaction with Whitecap, you weren't able to s fulfill a, you know, a 10-year transformation journey. You're on it for four or five years. But what, what, where do you see is the end state here? Where, how far could we go with these technologies? Yeah, you know, I, I think, I mean, what we see, what we've seen over the two and a half or three years of the field transformation, we had some amazing gains. Um, and, you know, they were so successful at the end that ultimately we were ready to go down the next path, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because at some point we actually brought in, you know, we, <laughs> if we were to back up a little bit, we mm -hmm. installed the digital devices, you know, then it was, we had a whole bunch of data streaming in, right? So then yep. it was, well, what do you do with that data? So then we got a data historian, right? Uh, you know, essentially a piece of software that can ingest all that data, gives you some good analytical intuitive tools where you can, you know, do graphical interfaces and, you know, um, start getting the data telling you what you need to do, where the yep. problems are. Right? Yep, yep. Um, and, uh, you know, things were working so well that, um, you know, we were ready to go down the next phase, which was, um, you know, bringing in an integrated operation center. Mm. So, you know, we, we were, you know, this happened sort of early 2020 and maybe uh, mid-2020 where we actually got going on a viability study yep. and uh, started doing cost estimates and things like that. Uh, but uh, that would have been the next phase for, for the company. Uh, but as far as the overall untapped potential for any oil company, um, you know, it, definitely optimization and quicker detection of anomalies, um, you know, and, and this all helps you to improve the bottom line. Um, safer operations, you know, less spills, um, mm -hmm. you know, safer operations from, from the standpoint of not having your operators drive pointlessly, right? They still have to get out there to, to a specific place, but like you said earlier, they, they sort of have a, have visibility into what's happening. What's going on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, prepared. You know, is it a spill? Is it a leak? Is it a sour well? Right. If you have a, um, you know, um, a stuffing box leak on a sour well, well, you know, you got to get go in there with, uh, with, with more caution than you typically would. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, we established a thing called maximum well capability on our wells. Um, and then we tracked the production for each well daily, as opposed to looking back at it 24 hours later and saying, well, this well didn't make uh, its, its potential. You know, we could actually see if a well isn't meeting it right right at the moment oh right? wow so it, it, moment know. by moment um control and management of production exactly oh, it's wow. like you know what yeah. this and you know this way it gave us a visibility into productivity of each of our wells now you know we brought in a lot of variables into the data historian so we saw the net backs we yep. saw with you know, the working interest and everything associated with it and then we could say well you know what this well is our biggest revenue generator you know, we need to focus on that. Yeah. If that well drops 10%, you know, we need to be on it essentially right now. Right? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's what this digital allows us to do. Um, you know, in a traditional sense, you would look back at it, you know, an engineer would look at it when they get to the office in the morning, they would, they would look at the data and say, well, not, something's wrong with that well, let's look at it. 
where in a, in a digital analytics sense, um, you see it as it's happening. As it's happening, yeah. Imagine getting a notification to directly to your phone or to your desktop saying, heads up, you know, your, your prize well <laughs> is, is drifted beyond the point where um, it, it's explainable just by, uh, you know, simple, uh, simple variations. There's something, something going on here and you can hop right on it. That, that's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and for a company who's drilling new wells, uh, I mean, a big prize here is is like what we've seen. Uh, you can drill more wells without adding a single operator. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, adding people to your operation, that costs money. So if you can do it with your existing well-trained people who understand company mentality and, and culture and, and safety philosophy, you know, it just makes your operations safe and, um, you know, and, and yeah, more and reliable. Durable. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. For sure. Um, you, know, yeah. well, you know the other areas. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say I I I just admire all of the uh, the, the gains and the possibilities here. Um, if if you were to kind of share uh, some some you know some lessons about what you you've learned along the way, um, I'm just thinking here maybe there's someone listening to this call who's in also in operations wrestling with, uh, you know, do we do this or not? What what, what would you share? What what would your advice be? For sure. Um, you know, first, I would say you're pr you'd probably be surprised if you look at what you have and what you can do with it, uh, as in uh, be, be, because companies, uh, you know, it, automation is not new for oil and gas companies. Pump off controllers have been a while, uh, around forever, you know, smart uh, timers on plunger lifts and stuff like that. But it's what do you do with this? Right. And it's that we've seen that even concentrating on that effort can generate a, a lot of revenue. And you know, if, if anything else, though, you get what you pay for, it, right. right? Right. So, if if you spend some smart money in some you know smart places, um, you can actually see a lot more value than than you would than you would typically think, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would say another lesson that um, came to light for us was that um, there's a cost to maintaining the digital equipment. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know that, that's one thing. That, well, why don't we just put in a bunch of cameras and don't yeah. worry about it? It will, yeah. it will work. Well, yeah. Truth is, you may need software updates. It may need to be calibrated. If it's a pressure transducer, yeah. uh, you know, they can fail in harsh conditions that we have here in Canada. Um, and, and you know what? The, the change uh, of technology, the pace of change is just tremendous right now. So uh, some of these devices may become obsolete. They may have to be replaced. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, finally, so, so that, that's all maybe on the negative side is that you need to be thinking about that. Yep. But um, one positive that I've really seen um, from our people is that, you know, innovation breeds innovation. You know, there, there's no such template as, as one or such thing as one template fits all. Right. right. Um, every operation is unique. And if you give people the ability to try something new and to operate with it, they will often come up with, um, you know, with even a better way of using it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Very, very powerful uh, observations. Chris, uh, uh, thank you very much for coming on to Digital Oil and Gas today and sharing your perspectives. Uh, very much appreciate um, the, the, the boots on the ground experience that you bring to bear uh, on, on this uh, topic. So thanks for coming today. Thank you for having me. Uh, this has been another episode of uh, Digital Oil and Gas, and if you uh, like what you've heard, uh, please press the like button. Uh, if you want to get a hold of uh, Chris, for instance, Chris, what's the best way for people to reach you if they're interested to learn more? Do you do um, like a, on LinkedIn, I suppose? Or yeah, I think LinkedIn is probably the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you better you better spell it though, because it's 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 Chris is with a K, so let's start there. It's K R K. Chris, it's K R Y S. <laughs> yep. And last name is K-O-R-C-Z-E-W-S-K-I. That's it. Gorkjevsky. Gorkjevsky. Uh, fantastic. Chris, thanks again. And um, I will, I'll be back in a week's time with another episode of uh, Digital Oil and Gas. And so safe travels, everyone. Bye for now.